welcome folks uh, <laughs> a couple of, a couple of minutes about uh, about the, the the origins of the uh, of the George Gale Sea Nurtured Artist book and exhibition and and a bit about uh, I started into a bit about why uh, I uh, I go out a little bit on a, on a on a limb here and call this you know say that George Gale is a pioneer in the art of the American nautical revival what do I mean by the nautical revival well um, he was working between the 19 teens and then and, and he died in uh, 1952 or 53 uh, and uh, and in that time uh, America the Amer American commercial sea um, Ascent, de declined to the point where it was uh, where it was really unimportant, and uh, it was an entire culture that had developed, certainly in New England and uh, and elsewhere up and down the East Coast from the origins of the of the nation. So, you know, the Mar American maritime culture had its has its roots in the 17th century, and uh, and seafaring was a way of life for hundreds of years and at the end it was in fact the end so the on the book you see an image of the of the bark wanderer of new bedford and in 1924 the wanderer washed ashore on cutty hunk and was wrecked and that was it that was the last square rigger out of new bedford and there she sat on the rocks and people picked up little bits and pieces of the wanderer and they made uh, they made uh, souvenirs out of them, and they took photographs, and they made picture frames, and they saved bits and pieces of this final end of Yankee whaling. Um, and one final ship, the Charles W. Morgan, which was built in New Bedford in 1841, was was saved and preserved at Mystic, uh, and Mystic Seaport Museum itself was established in the 1920s. Uh, specifically to preserve maritime culture, um, and American maritime culture, and you know, as George Gale is uh, is working, you know, on the New Bedford waterfront in in the 1920s, this stuff is disappearing. And what he did was, and we'll we'll go through this. His whole presentation is about this. Is he took it upon himself to to document in detail the trades and the people. Uh, who, who portraps people and sailors and the ships themselves. Um, and he had, you know, some of his contemporaries did likewise, like Clifford Ashley and, and, uh, and Clement Nye Swift and, uh, and Albert Cook Church and, and William Tripp, uh, you know, the curator at the Whaling Museum, um, and many others uh, all undertook to, to preserve so maybe instead of saying a pioneer in the art of American nautical revival, I should say a pioneer in the pres preservation of, uh, of the American nautical experience. Because that's really, uh, really what George Gale did. Um, uh, he was born in 1893 and died in 1951. So um, he's remembered by a plaster cast by, made by his wife, uh, Mary Drown Gale. Um, he was born in Bristol, Rhode Island, and lived in Barrington, uh, Rhode Island. Um, he is—he came from a seafaring family. His grandfather, on his mother's side, uh, George uh, Tubbs, uh, was a sailor and a steamboat captain, living and working in Bristol, Rhode Island. Um, and teenager worked—you know—he he had his really his first real experience. Uh, was uh, working in the, in the uh, Harrishoff Manufacturing Company yacht yard in uh, in Bristol. So from a from an early age, his his uh, his grandfather was a was a sea captain, uh, and and he worked in the in the in the Harrishoff Harrishoff yard. Um, his wife, who, who they they uh, Mary, they they met in uh, at the Rhode Island School of Design, uh, where they they were both students. Uh, and so she, she was an, uh, quite an artist in her own right. To people who remember the Gales, and the nice thing about about working with uh, with this particular with this particular person is that there are people who who knew the family, who had been in the studio, uh, who knew you know that he he built his own uh, schooner, uh, two two or three little schooners, and 
uh, and he was quite a yachtsman and uh, and, he, and he was quite a um quite a creative character in many ways um so you can really see from this plaster bust that uh, that this is a this is a family devoted to devoted to art so <clears throat> Uh, he was 21 years old uh, in, in 1914 when he joined uh, the uh, American Hawaiian Line General Freighter SS Hawaiian. And these, these freighters uh, ran regular routes, and the Hawaiian ran between Baltimore, New York, the West Indies, uh, and ports in South America, including Buenos Aires, Montevideo, and Rio de Janeiro. Uh, uh, he was the U.S. shipping uh, board steamer SS West Eagle. Um, uh, from Canadian ports to France and England uh, during the uh, during World War One, uh, he made twelve voyages, uh, including three transatlantic passages to the Mediterranean and the coast of France uh, during the First World War. Uh, and this uh, this photograph uh, is of the Hawaiian. Um, you can, uh, if if you look closely, you can you can see that uh, there, there's her name uh, right there. And as I, as I said in the introduction, there, we have a, a, a deep body of material on which to study George Gale uh, and to, to attempt really to get, to get at his motivations and to get at his techniques and to get at his inspiration. And his illustrated sea journals kept on board the Hawaiian are, are, uh, are real treasures. Uh, these, are, these are beautiful pieces and these are uh, these journals were kept before he became any sort of a formal commercial artist. Um, you can see uh, on the left, uh, there's the, uh, the Kentuckian, um, let's see, the SS Kentuckian, an American Hawaiian line steamer built in 1910 to make regular cargo passages from the East Panama Canal, chartered by the U.S. Army as a troop transport and car cargo ship in World War I. Um, and then there's a little notation uh, in the upper uh, upper corner here. Uh, it says, you know, Barber Line. And the Barber, li the Barber Steamship Line chartered American uh, Hawaiian American steamers to capitalize on the advantages of being a neutral carrier to South American ports in the years leading up to World War I. Um, this is like a, this is like a colored pencil or, or crayon view of the of the Kentuckian. Uh, on the on the right are uh, a couple of pages from the journal that really show his interest and devotion to craft of seamanship on square riggers. He never sailed on a square rigger. Uh, in some of his um, bio biographical uh, sort of overviews, there is a suggestion that he he did sail on a square rigger, but his wife said. Uh, that he never did, and uh, in his journals, he, uh, he 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 clearly says that he was invited to uh, to uh, to join a full rigger as he turned uh, as he turned these big big sailing ships. He was he was in, invited to join a full rigger um, uh, on the the Nor Norwegian bark Dagny, uh, but but he but he never but he never he never did it, uh, but he. Not Nonetheless, focused his uh, his really considerable artistic skill on the craft of seamanship and uh, and the real details of what a sailor's work was. Quite extraordinary. For all of his experience in the transatlantic passages in, in World War One, there's only one illustration, uh, and it's this watercolor, which. Uh, <coughs> which um, we found in the collection. Uh, it was undocumented. It was in a, in a folder. Uh, and this was probably a magazine illustration uh, of some sort or other. Uh, and, but it shows a, uh, an experience that he witnessed directly. So he wrote in his journal on May 20th, uh, 1918, as he stood the helm of the Hawaiian, he writes this in his journal. Saw a streak boiling across the bow from port to starboard, and a torpedo hit the new Sweden forward of the bridge, sending a column of water to the mastheads. She heeled to port at once. The third mate promptly ordered the helm hard a starboard, and I spun her over. He rang the alarm and the telegraph full ahead in a jingle. 
the cruiser dropped a depth bomb, but don't know if it got the sub. At 10 p.m., there was a lot of heavy gunfire on the port beam and quarter. The new Sweden lay by the hell her last. Alberin Island light a beam at midnight, zigzagging all night. So the primary text that he wrote and the and the painting that he that he made uh, really do go together uh, exceptionally well. Um, it, it's a it's a real insight into his life, into his career. Uh, into his perceptions as an artist and, and as a sailor. After the war, after the war, he was awarded a scholarship to the Rhode Island School of Design based on the strength of his, of his draftsmanship. Um, one biographer said that he Drew like um, his his very first illustrated journal apparently was commandeered by his first skipper uh, because the art was so extraordinary and we don't have his very first journal but we have four other ones. Uh, but then uh, in the summers when he was not in uh, at the Rhode Island School of Design, he sailed on the on the schooner Coral, which was registered in Newport but sailed out of New Bedford and Fairhaven carrying cargo to Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. At this point, this is in the early 1920s. So George Gale is on the New Bedford waterfront in the final days of the whale fishery. <laughs> this, is a, this is a textile port, it's a coal port. There's, a, a, there's whaling schooners still sailing out, a couple of square riggers, the Charles W. Morgan, the Wanderer, um, uh, but very, few others and um, and from this time he begins to to look back in history and to work with photographs and to work with historical uh, documents and stories you can tell from the art that he's deriving these uh, images from from stories uh, of the of the whaling fleet from the 19th century and in, in, the, in the early 20th century, but in the meantime, he was a coral. Um, I included this um, this image of the um, of the Naples brig uh, simply because it, it it's it's fairly late. Uh, it's copper. It's a copper engraving. Uh, he 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 first started his work in the Rhode Island. School of Design working on, on zinc plates. So the earliest plates were zinc, but then he, uh, but then he moved on to copper plates. And this is a this is a copper etching uh, called Bound for Naples, and it it harkens back. It was probably done in the late uh, 1920s or early 1930s, and it harkens back to his time in the Mediterranean uh, when he uh, he refers in his journals to to seeing a brig uh, off Naples. Uh, in the Mediterranean in the First World War. So he's, he's drawing on memory, he's drawing on experience. Um, he's also drawing on his own ideas of, of, of what, uh, what life would have been like on a whaler. So this is his, this is his grandfather, uh, George Tubbs, and uh, and he, he has him set up there with a uh, with a with a quadrant, um, at taking a sight um, uh, on on a you know with with a with a on a, on a on a whaler. So it's obviously a whaler. There's a heavy davit and there's a whale boat and and I, I you know at this point I'm going to draw your attention uh, to this to this hook right here, um, and it's the this hook and things like it that really make George Gale's work important. Uh, he spent painstaking time sketching such details over and over and over again. He specialized in the way that hands grasped tools. He, his, his, his sketches are full of hands holding tools tools themselves 
uh, and from all different points of view. And so, you know, he really wanted to capture the essence of, of his sub. Um, this is one of his copper plates. Uh, it's called Coming Onto the Grounds, and it shows, um, it shows sailors uh, working on deck, sharpening whale craft. So we've got a uh, double flued iron here. We've got a, uh, an improved toggle iron here. We've got a boarding knife uh, here. Um, and, uh, and these fellows are working at the grindstone. You know, they're sharpening their tools. In the background here, you see there's a, there's a plane on the workbench. And if he drew one plane, he drew a thousand planes. He was drawing planes constantly drawing planes and constantly uh, trying to get the, the shape of the, of the man working with the tools just right. But he's a whimsical character, George Gale, and he shows, and here in the lower left, he's got the cat. Uh, it's just, a, you know, it's, it's reality that, that he's tried to, to capture, I think, and a bit of whimsy as well. Um, and that reality and that whimsy, uh, you know, is, is evident here in his, in his self-portrait. So here he is, emptying the bucket from the seat of ease, you know, from this is the chamber pot. Uh, you can see the hole there, you know, or you, you'd sit there and, there, and there's, the, there's the bucket. And, uh, and then he toss the bucket over, over the side. And, and here he is, you know, his sort of nose is upturned and he's keeping his tobacco smoke nice and close to his face. Um, it, it nobody draws or photographs stuff like this, um, and so again, he's uh, he's capturing the essence of something that's that that's disappearing. This is a perplexing image because, according to the documents, according to the logbooks, the coral was sailing to Nantucket with a deck load of gasoline. So smoking his pipe while standing on, you know, 50 gallon drums of gasoline, um, that's, uh, that's not good. <laughs> um, and so he doesn't actually tell us, you know, he says he's reefing the mainsail. So he doesn't, we don't know what the deck load is in the image. Maybe he smoked his pipe, maybe he didn't, who knows. But uh, I, I, would, I would doubt that the, that the captain, or I would imagine the captain would frown on a, on a sailor, um, you know, smoking around a deck load of gasoline. But in the, you know, these prints are worth studying. The knots and the way that the, the lines work with the man, um, uh, there's a lot to learn there. Um, he, uh, George Gale worked as a, he worked on the on the um, on the, the Washington Bridge uh, in Providence. Uh, he was he 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 worked with the uh, with the engineers on the bridge, but then he also uh, worked. Apparently, it was a uh, the, the bridge had a draw uh, at one point, and he worked on the draw, and uh, and he he drew a lot of pictures. He made a lot of pictures of the tugboat, the Gaspe. Uh, on, on the river, around the bridge. And so you see, you see the uh, many tug images. This happens to be a, a, a linoleum print. So we don't actually, I don't think we have the linoleum print itself, but we have the, uh, we have the, uh, the, resulting, uh, the resulting print. We called it the river horse. So um, this is an example of a, of a scene that uh, he probably never saw. So, you know, the, the, the Bark Niger, square riggers were hauled down all the time at the wharves in New Bedford to, have, to be recoppered. Um, and, uh, and there were numerous photographs, many photographs of this. Uh, but by the time he was on the waterfront, um, those days were, uh, were, were pretty much past. Um, so evidently he worked from photographs uh, to create these scenes. Uh, they're quite extraordinary. Um, so the background scene, you know, of the ship hove down, the men working, you know, uh, peeling the copper and recalking, um, uh, matches a photograph pretty well. Um, I don't know if I can 
move myself so you can see. I guess not. Uh, but the but the photograph um, of of the of the Niger, you know, matches the matches the print pretty well, except for the guys in the foreground. So uh, you know, he uh, he took a little bit of artistic license uh, or um, created an image. This is another scene that he, that turns up many many times. Um, the the almost faceless, incredibly muscular, shirtless uh, harpooner uh, hurling or, or placing, planting a harpoon um, in a sperm whale. Uh, Gail strove to capture the, this kind of a view in a way that, that nobody, nobody else did. So he used his imagination um, and he and he may also uh, he may also have used you know the the the, the whale boat itself in the New Bedford Whaling Museum as as a model um, uh, maybe um, but uh, but he tries to preserve the essence of something that that really hadn't been preserved before you don't see very many images of of harpooners in action. You also don't see uh, the kind of boring stuff. Um, he loved carts and he loved horses. And in his um, in his reference files, there are hundreds of pictures of carts and hundreds of pictures of horses. And he and he uh, he he captures these these sort of tedious unimportant aspects of uh, what seemed like unimportant aspects of life on the waterfront but were actually extremely important aspects you know this is a this is a uh, this is a cask cart you know so when moving casks are boy put them on you, you put them on a cart and haul them around with horses but who's ever who's ever seen that you know you don't see it in photographs um, and you don't see it in, in other uh, other uh, illustrations or paintings you know Benjamin Russell certainly never never painted any such thing. Uh, William Bradford never painted any such thing. Um, so uh, George Gale did. And, uh, and he did it very late in the game, but he did it extremely well. And, uh, and it, 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 uh, it captures something. Uh, this apparently is a self-portrait. Um, his son uh, told me this was a, this was a self-portrait. He had two sons, one of whom passed and the other lives in Virginia. But uh, his son told me that this was a self-portrait of, of George um, going clamming. It's kind of cool. So, did he romanticize his views? I don't know if he romanticized his views or not. Uh, Clifford Ashley took photographs like this when Tripp took photographs like this. Um, uh, George Gale um, built on, on their work and drew from his own experience. So this print, which was a critically acclaimed uh, print in the art world, Heave and Buster, uh, is, shows the crew of a schooner working at the windlass so he you know, busts the anchor loose from the bottom of the, uh, you know, from the from the sea floor, and there's the first mate, you know, standing where the first mate is supposed to stand, at the top of the forecastle, and he's overseeing the work, and these men strain mightily at their at their uh, at their work. They're faceless; you don't see their faces. It's an extraordinary aspect of Gale's work, is that seldom will he show you the faces of the men. Although he'll show you their anatomy, um, you don't see their faces, and if you do, they're 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 tough looking. They're very brutal looking faces. There's nothing gentle or soft about the face of a, of George Gale's men. Um, they're they're tough looking guys. A view, you know, of a whaleboat going on to a sperm whale or fast to a sperm whale from the stern or from the bow these these are, are you don't see them at all so 
the people who really captured this are the people who were very, very close to it. So Clifford Ashley captured very similar views to this, but George Gale uh, is the only artist that I know of that, that captured the stern view, you know, looking, uh, looking at a whaleboat from behind uh, and what the crew would have been looking like and how the boat would have moved in the water and the dimension size of the animal compared to the size of the boat. And, uh, and you know, notice the, 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 the way this ash oar is, is bending. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, he, he knew the, the way the wood would move under stress. Um, and, you know, this is almost, you know, his, his men are almost, you know, Winslow Homer-like, you know, in their, uh, in their real uh, heroic sort of strength. Uh, the air or Tucker on, you know, by the time, uh, by the time George Gale, uh, George Gale was on the scene, um, she was, she was built in Dartmouth in 1851 and broken up in 1908, so Gale never saw her at all. The greasy luck that Barca or Tucker, but she shows, you know, the vessel deeply laden uh, coming in, um, and why the A.R. Tucker, um, who knows why? Uh, was it derived from a photograph, perhaps? Was it derived from conversations with former crew members or conversations with people who knew the vessel? I, I don't know. Um, but you see it time and again within his work that, that you know, he focuses on these, on, on these ships um, and, and, uh, and brings them back to land every day. Uh, in a way that perhaps had never been uh, preserved. Um, horses and carts, you know, loading stores, sailing day. So there, here you see the pencil sketch. This pencil sketch would have been transferred to a copper plate. And then the copper plate um, covered with a ground and etched. So, uh, so you can see that there's a, that there is a, that, that the, re the print itself is reversed from this, from the sketch, which makes perfect sense, because you know, as the as the as the print pro in the print process, the the final product is gonna is going to come out in opposite from the from the way it was put down in the first place. So, the the uh, the the texture that he puts into these uh, into everything he does in these etchings makes them pop makes them really brilliant uh, and, and and makes you want to look closely at the details like the you know how baggy the man's the man's pants are or the you know the the tongue of the horse um, or, you know or the or the way the man's hand is, is grasping the, the rein uh, the reins of, of the horse and how the horses themselves move um, so you know you really the art pulls you in Now here's a whole series. This is an interesting uh, sketch on the left, but the important part is the Eliza Adams uh, drawn, um, uh, graphed up, uh, and ready to be uh, ready to be transferred to the plate. So this is the Eliza Adams, and in my estimation, this is probably one of his most successful uh, ship portraits of all. Um, that's the final. There's the final etching of the Eliza Adams. The Eliza Adams was a you know very old vessel built at Fairy Haven in 1835 and broken up uh, in 18 we have bits and pieces of the Eliza Adams uh, held in the in the uh, in the whaling museum collection um, but here you see the entire process so the from the, the, the graph to, to the sketch uh, to the engraving plate itself, uh, to the to the final print, and you know the, this is what this is what makes a great collection great. You know when you can really draw on so many elements of the of the artist's uh, production. And they have his oil paintings, and uh, the, his oil paintings are less successful, in my opinion. Um, they uh, they're 
certainly great painters. Um, but uh, compared to the etchings, uh, I, I think that uh, perhaps they're not quite as um, not quite as uh, as visceral. Um, the scene on the left, the trod boat from uh, from 1937. He derived this view um, from an old Dartmouth Historical Society pamphlet written by curator Bill Tripp of a deadly event on the 1912 voyage of the Bark Wanderer. Um, Lester Moshe was the master, and a seaman was killed in the act of hunting a hundred barrel sperm whale. And the pamphlet itself is in his is in his archive. And if you if you read the the, the story, it, this is a direct interpretation uh, of the events that led to the death of the man. Um, the crew in the background has a this guy has a shoulder gun, uh, and he's uh, you know getting ready to to shoot the whale. The whale itself is spout out in thick anyway, but uh, but it's fighting to the very end. Um, and man in the water is looking on, you know, at the imminent demise of his shipmates. <clears throat> now, uh, th this is a, a pen and ink sketch uh, derived directly from a photograph by William H. Tripp. And so you can see the faces of the men. You can see their features uh, in a way that you seldom do with other Gale pictures, and uh, and that's because uh, that's because Trip Trip took the photograph. Trip sailed on the Wanderer in 1922, and he was on the boat, and he took the photograph, uh, and then Gale uh, and then Gale um, uh, copied it. You know these guys in their overalls. You know they're this is a this is a far cry from the American whalemen of the 1940s or the 1840s. You know. Here's a whole series of sketches leading up to both a copper plate print and uh, and an oil painting. And so there's a there's a whole file full of folder full of these of these fighting whale sketches with a boat upside down and bits and pieces of it broken. Um, this this sort of damage is uh, was is visible on the on the old Dartmouth Historical Society whaleboat, uh, the one that was in the uh, in the Lagoda room and it is now at storage in Nash Road. You can see that the that the, the where the planks join the the the, uh, the stem post on that boat that, that uh, they're they're starting they're, they're popping out, um, and uh, and that boat was was damaged uh, at some point in its in its career. But uh, you know in the in the you know the the details of all the gear. You know, stove boat scenes are pretty common. Whaleman drew, did draw stove boat scenes and they drew some very, very good ones, um, but, uh, but none uh, with, from a perspective of, uh, you know, in the boat like this, with these kind, with this level of detail, uh, or it's, um, you know, it's, it's just really, really pretty extraordinary and, and it demonstrates uh, the level of Gale's imagination as an artist, his, uh, the level of his research, uh, and uh, and obviously the, his passion for uh, for getting this stuff right. He didn't always get it right. Uh, this uh, this is a silly looking sperm whale. I think it's probably a pretty unsuccessful sperm whale. This is a, this is a pretty early zinc plate. Um, uh, and again, you can see the you know the, the way that the steering oar you know bends and uh, but the whale itself uh, is uh, needs work. Um, this this scene on the right, you know, hoisting a whaleboat is is pretty uh, interesting because the men are standing on the on the um, after cabin on a square rigger. So that's not a uh, that's not a schooner. Those guys are hauling up the the, the starboard boat, the captain's boat, um, getting ready to to uh, to uh, to you know haul, haul it up, and get it fast, um, and you can you you, know, you really can see the the working sailor. In the in you know in the posture of the men and the way their hands grip the ropes, uh, the amount of uh, you know incredible labor and strength it took to do the job. Uh, he painted many views of the wanderer cutting and boiling. Uh, this particular view is it was a donation by um, uh, by. Um, Jim Harvey's sister. Um, I have her 
name. I don't have it right in front of me. Uh, but he, he drew several views, several views of the wanderer uh, cutting, cutting and boiling like this. Um, we have three now in the collection. Um, this was the th this was the third. It's very different from the from the other two that we have. One of which is hanging in the uh, in the Cape Verdean Maritime Gallery, uh, and the other one is uh, is in storage. But uh, but you know you, if you can imagine, if you go back for a second, these fellows uh, standing on the roof of the after cabin and and hauling. And here's the after cabin. So they'd be standing on the roof up there, uh, hauling up that uh, hauling up that whaleboat. Gail never actually witnessed this. Ashley did, and Tripp did, and so chances are very good that uh, that his that Gail's work is derived from their their experience and their photographs. Um, this is an incredibly successful painting, probably I think maybe one of his most successful paintings, at least in our collection, um, showing a, a harpooner uh, preparing to get fast. Um, and it really is uh, everything about it, the composition, the, the, the proximity of the boat to the whale, the fact that the man is not hurling this harpoon like a javelin. He's waiting to get right up wood to black skin um, before he puts that uh, harpoon into the, into the animal. Uh, and it's dated 1940. So, um, From his earliest sketchbooks, you can see that, that he, uh, he, he took that same idea and, uh, and used it um, to, create, uh, to, create a, to create an original etching, bending the lower topsails. Uh, this is a split rig, so um, you know, at this time, square riggers did not have one large topsail. They had a lower topsail and an upper topsail. It was called a split 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 topsail, split rig topsail. And so they're bending the lower topsail and this fella is passing the airing. Um, he is a highly experienced sailor, probably one of the, the most experienced sailors on shipboard, uh, engaged in this exceptionally um, tricky and, um, and it demanded a high level of seamanship and expertise to do this. And so while you, if, if we approach this image strictly from the point of view of an image, it's like, oh wow, that's pretty cool. Look at these guys are on the, on the foot rope and they're doing their sailor thing. But if you approach it from the point of view uh, of, of documentation, uh, I suspect that we can, uh, we can gain a, a lot more insight into, uh, into what is actually, uh, what's actually going on uh, in that scene, you know, in, in this event, which happened on, on square riggers all the time. These happen to be my two favorite uh, images um, of George Gale's. The shipyard uh, is a quintessential George Gale. I mean, everything about it is absolutely perfect. He drew this, uh, this figure uh, driving a spike. Uh, uh, he, 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 he actually drew uh, men in the Fairhaven shipyard. He drew men uh, in, the, in the Harrishoff yard. Um, swinging these, um, swinging these spike hammers. Uh, you know, he's got clamps. He's got the handle of a of a wood saw. Uh, he's got again the man with his hands on the plane. Faces obscured, hats pulled down. You don't see them. You see the work that they're doing. Um, they're obscure. They're faceless. And perhaps that's the message that many of the characters, many of the craftspeople of American maritime trades were in fact pretty faceless, highly skilled, um, not men of renown, but heroic nonetheless, perhaps. I just love this picture. It's just, you know, there's, I know of one other picture of, of, of whale oil being discharged you know, from a from a ship. Uh, it was uh, it was drawn in 1959, 1859, and it showed a, a donkey engine. Showed, showed an actual steam engine being used to haul uh, haul the, the the casks uh, up. Um, but uh, but this 
you know, with the horses, these dra big draft horses are straining um, to, to lift a ton of oil uh, in one of these, uh, you know, 200 gallon casks uh, and a big, you know, big blocks. And uh, it's just, uh, it's just a pretty extraordinary thing. So the horses are straining, but the, but the guy controlling the horses, he's, he's pretty calm. Um, he, he's got it going on. He knows what he's doing. These are these are just a couple of more you know great engravings of uh, uh, you know copper engravings of you know of the subject. Um, one curious bit: this is this is the image on the cover of the book. So you know this is the this is the book, and there's the there's the cover of the book. <laughs> the N is inverted in Wanderer, and I don't know why that is. Whether it's, he made a mistake, if he did make a mistake, he made it twice before uh, actually producing the print um, or he did it on purpose um, he's an interesting character George Gale and, and and the more you study his work um, the more you see in the details this is a perfect example you know these are riggers in the foretop and uh, I was so confused by what was going on with this I had to send this picture to Mary Kay Burkhall Edwards down to Mystic Seaport to see if we could figure out uh, in this because you know this is the this is the four top facing forward but here's the here's the yard which is at which is perpendicular which is parallel to the hull of the ship it's, it's perpendicular to where it's supposed to be and there's an, another uh, mast and top and yard in the back where unless it's a, an adjacent ship it, it has absolutely no place being on board this vessel so um, you know some of the details that he shows here, you know, this uh, right here, this is called the lubber's hole. And so inexperienced sailors would, would go up the, up the ratlins and they go in the, in the lubber's hole, but everybody else, all the experienced sailors, uh, would go up around the outside. And you can see that there's foot ropes uh, and they, they would swing themselves up onto the top. And so that's what this rigger is doing. You know, he's got a bag full of tools and he's got a rope hanging down and he's, uh, he's, he's on his way up here to do some work. And there's another rigger up there smoking his pipe uh, and they're all getting ready to, uh, you know, to do whatever it is that needs to be done. It probably has something to do with this big block coming up. And they're sending something up um, to uh, to be um, to be to be rigged. And uh, don't know what, um, but you know, for 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 students of um, you know the details of of nautical experience, George Gale's prints are perfect. Um, last. Uh, is this extraordinary image of the harpooner uh, full face full detail of the of the of the bow of the whale boat and uh, really just the the end you know this is the final image in the book and I chose it as the final image of the book because it's the it's the end of Yankee whaling this is you know this is the man uh, who who worked in the fishery uh for for generations and uh and they they're gone um they were they were disappearing and they were um not particularly uh, heralded you know in their uh in their lives outside of their own circle of people and so um so i think it's a fitting in uh to to the presentation and uh and a fitting summation to to George Gale's work. So that's it, folks. I'll be happy to answer any questions or engage in any conversation that you might be interested in. I mentioned in the beginning that if you do have any questions or comments, you can utilize our chat box feature, and you can find that by navigating your cursor to the bottom of your screen and clicking on chat and then just messaging all panelists and both Mike and I will be able to see that. Um, Mike, if you want to stop sharing your screen, you might have a little bit more access um, to the chat box if you're not able to see it. I'm not sure what your yeah. view is currently. Stop share. There you go. So now if you run your cursor on the bottom, it'll say yeah. chat. Um, and then you will be able to see, Bob mentioned something earlier on, but I'm not sure if you had already gone past it, so that's why I didn't mention it. 
Um, and then we also have Kathleen O'Halloran. I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right. She just said, thank you. That was wonderful. So what is this comment about the smoking the pipe on the coral that Bob, Bob DeManchin knows about? Here, I'll allow Bob Rocha to talk so that way he can clarify. Bob, I have given you rights to speak if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, this is Bob DeManch calling. Hi, Bob. Um, and I believe, uh, well, Donald Tucker talks about this. Uh, it's his father who owned the coral at the time. And I think he's on the talk right now. Um, and his uh, daughter might help him uh, access. So if, if he would like to uh, speak about his father smoking aboard the vessel going to Nantucket, um, I defer to him right now. I don't know if he's on the air though. Love to hear that story. Uh, um, Donald Tucker is on. So Donald, I'm going to allow you to talk. If you don't want to, just shut it off and we'll know. <laughs> his daughter's there to help him, I, I believe. Yeah. Yep, he has audio on. Uh, yes, good evening. A very interesting uh, story. Uh, as far as uh, the gasoline going to Nantucket, uh, I couldn't understand at my age how I how he could possibly have a pipe going. And uh, so my father explained to me that uh, with the wind blowing in the direction that it was, they always add, added to the to the, uh, the the direction of the wind, and quite often uh, they would not even have the pipe lit, but uh, they always always managed to be in the right the wind coming from the right direction. Well, that's that. That would be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but you also uh, spoke about your father with his cigarettes and um, and the same thing where he he was um, not as concerned as you might be. Um, but you you did speak about that how you know any of the embers would uh, the wind would just take it and uh, he he would do that himself. Correct. That is correct, yes, Robin. Yeah. And he, uh, yeah. His, uh, his cigarettes were, were camels, and how he lived as long as he did, smoking cigars and pipes and cigarettes, I don't know. But, uh, was... <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, that's uh, three. Okay. So, that, uh, I... Go ahead. Say again. Go, go ahead. Uh, I'm finished. I see we have a uh, we have another comment uh, coming in here from uh, Kathleen O'Halloran uh, saying, I'm an acquaintance of the grandson of James Cree, who was also a contemporary of Yale. Yes, he was. Has, uh, we have a couple of uh, Cree paintings. Uh, in the, uh, one is of the schooner. Um, I don't know if we have a Cree of the Wanderer. I know we have a Cree of a, of a uh, we have two, two James Cree um, paintings. I think they're both of schooners. I think it was Pedro Varela. Um, but, uh, but yes, he was, an, he was a, another artist working on the waterfront and documenting the vessels that were there. Um, I don't know enough really about the, I haven't seen enough examples of his work to know if he got quite uh, into the same level of detail that, that, uh, that some of the other artists did as far as the as far as the working on shipboard is concerned. 